Thanks for joining us tonight. Bethel is glad you're here. We're continuing our studies with scriptures difficult to understand, and let's get right into it. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt betrayed or disgusted or enraged or maybe even antagonized by someone? Or perhaps you've witnessed someone in those stages and words like this came out. They'll get what's coming to them. What goes around comes around. They've got it coming. They're gonna get a taste of their own medicine. Don't take it lying down. Don't get mad, get even. Payback is coming. Revenge is sweet. Now I know we've all been down that road. We have wished payback for those who have done us wrong. Or perhaps the tragedies that happened in this world that just didn't deserve to happen. They require justice. Even the evils that go on in this world, they just deserve no mercy, right? Just like the introductory verse said at the beginning, O oh Lord, how long will the wicked triumph? Shine forth your vengeance, O oh Lord. So how do we as believers deal with events in our lives that deserve justice and retribution and, and vengeance? In order to understand how, we need to go back to some Old Testament scriptures. We're gonna be looking at some scriptures that are prayers for revenge. Prayers that are seeking justice or retribution or even vengeance. Amazingly, we find these prayers in the book of the Psalms. Now, we're more familiar with the Psalms being like songs or poems, right, of encouragement. But there are at least 10 Psalms that are considered imprecatory Psalms. Imprecatory meaning songs that utter curses. And we'll look at a couple of them that fall under imprecatory Psalms seeking justice. Let's start with the first Psalm, Psalm 137. Now, let me give you some history about this Psalm. Because of their disobedience and their idolatry, the Israelites have been taken captive by Babylon. Now, the Babylonian army was well known for their brutality. And this psalm is written by someone who experienced and witnessed the Babylonians' barbaric acts. Now, let's read here the first six verses of Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem, above my chief joy. Can you hear the, the grief, the brokenness in this psalmist's heart? He's speaking on behalf of the people when he says, we sat there, we wept there, we remembered Zion. And the psalmist mentions that their captors, the Babylonians, asked the people to sing one of their songs. And in verse three, it says they requested mirth, which translated means amusement. So because of their known cruelty, the Babylonians just asked of them this song because it was their way of inflicting more sorrow, more pain. It was a way to torment them even more. So the psalmist says, how can we sing? How they yearned for their homeland, Jerusalem. They didn't want to forget. Let's look here in verses 7 through 9. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. And there's that difficult passage to understand. Verse nine, what it's saying is happy is the one who slaughters your children. How can we logically explain that Psalm 137 is divine scripture? For starters, we need to understand the culture back in the Old Testament times. Now remember, we've already established that God has called his people, starting with Abram, to be a separate people, a holy people. And it was through their lineage that the Savior would come. And it was through them that God had a redemptive plan. Now during the time of Moses, God gave his people commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, but other commandments that they were to keep in order to keep themselves separate and holy. Their faith required obedience. One of their laws was called the laws of retribution, which means to give back that which is due. 
The principle was that the punishment for the crime had to be equivalent with the offense. This was their guiding principle for any judgment. In the book of Deuteronomy, we will find the commands that God gave Moses so that the people would purge the evil that was among them. And they had to be obedient in order to keep themselves free from idolatry and from the immorality and the evils that existed among those nations. Look here at Deuteronomy 19. Then you shall go do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. And those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. Life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. In Exodus 21, 25, we see where God also adds on there, a wound for a wound, a burn for a burn, a stripe for a stripe. So while verse 9 to us sounds cruel and gruesome to dash your children against the rock, we need to see it from the psalmist's point of view in his lifetime. Their guiding principle for judgment was a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And secondly, through the prophet Jeremiah, God had already promised that he would fully repay Babylon for their atrocities and he would burn down their walls. So as we look at this prayer seeking justice, we see here and we understand the psalm a little better. Number one, the psalmist was not asking for personal vengeance. He was asking God to take action on something that he had already promised. He was not asking for something out of the ordinary because as they understood judgment, a life for a life. So he was asking God the way they treated our children. You've seen how they have treated our children, how they killed our children. Do to them, repay to them what they've done to us. And second, the psalmist was not concerned about his own cause, but only for God's. The psalmist had a deep desire that God's plan might be fulfilled through their people for his glory. And you can see that in his plea that they not forget Jerusalem. So now we can understand this Psalm 137 a little bit better, this prayer for revenge. This psalmist was only asking for something that they understood how judgment should be carried out and how God had already promised that he would fully repay the Babylonians for their cruelty. Now let's look at the next imprecatory psalm. We'll find it in Psalm 69. Let me read a couple verses here, starting with verse 16. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink." Now this psalm has portions that are often quoted in the New Testament. And the psalmist of this chapter describes a person who is in the depths of despair and suffering greatly because of their faithfulness to God. And some portions of this chapter foreshadow the suffering of Jesus. You might have picked it up in that line, they gave me vinegar to drink. The psalmist here is crying out to the Lord on behalf of the nation of Israel to deliver them from their enemies. Now let's read here the prayer of revenge that the psalmist made. Let's look at verses 22 to 28. Let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck, and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. The psalmist here is calling for the full wrath of God over their enemies. And he's asking God to punish the enemies to the fullest extent. Now the opening of this psalm, I think it appeals to all of us because it appeals to our human emotion, how we feel 
When we come before the Lord, when we're in trouble, when we're in desperate need, when we need an answer, when we need a miracle, right? And just the way the psalmist expressed, Lord, you are good. You are merciful. I need you. I'm in trouble. Answer me speedily, right? We can all relate to that kind of despair. We've all been there where we needed something from God, right? But then again, we see in starting with verses 22, how the psalmist is looking for the divine justice from God. And he is seeking vengeance that only God can give. He understands that only God can give this vengeance over their enemies. Haven't we prayed prayers like that similar to this? Maybe not in such harsh words like the psalmist did. But we pray prayers when someone has done us wrong and we say, Lord, show them. Show them the error of their way, Lord discipline them Lord may they encounter what it's like to go through what I've gone through we think we know what a person needs to go through in order to suffer or be punished right but isn't really only God the one who is qualified to bring justice right in Deuteronomy 32 we find a song that God gave to Moses and this song was to be taught to the Israelites and they were to sing it as a reminder that Faith required obedience. Their whole existence was a result of God's faithfulness and His mercy. And this song served as a warning that if they were disobedient, it would bring God's judgment on them. Of course, we know that Israel would be disobedient many more times. They would repent, they would again return to their wicked ways, they would repent, and then they would go right back. But God used other nations to bring punishment for their disobedience. But in that song, God gave a statement, first to Israel, then to all their enemies. It says here in verse 35, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. In the NIV version, it says, It is mine to avenge. I will repay. So this statement reflects both judgment and hope. It did back then for his people, and it stands true for us today. God will punish those who disobey, and God alone will bring justice. So while you may have that same prayer of desperation or that same uh, prayer of seeking justice from God and saying, Lord, you've seen what they've done to me. You've seen what they've done to my family. You've seen the wrong that has been done towards us. Lord, this is uncalled for. This is not right, Lord. This is wrong, Lord. Punish, Lord, bring justice. We need to understand that, yes, God hears. God hears that prayer. But again, we have to understand that only God can do so in his time. While we want to see God's wrath right here and now, we need to know that one day there will be a final time of judgment. And God says, I will avenge. I will repay. Only God is the righteous judge, and he will bring vengeance. Amen. Only God. So now let's move on to another imprecatory psalm, Psalm 109. Here's a background on this one. This psalm is not a soothing psalm. This psalm is not a comforting psalm. It does not inspire us to worship, much less praise God. This is probably the harshest of all the imprecatory psalms. Who wrote it? David. Ah, well, since he was known as a man after God's own heart, it must have been justified, right? But within this psalm are some troubling words that we cannot understand, much less try to explain. But just like the word tells us, that every scripture is inspired by God and useful. So there must be a reason, there must be something we can learn from this Psalm 109. Let me start by reading the first five verses. Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. In this Psalm, David is seeking retribution on someone who has been his friend, but has lied about him, attacked him, and falsely accused him. But did you hear the attitude in his words? David is speaking with a confidence of a man who is right standing before God. 
David is a worshiper of God and he tells them, I gave them love. I showed them good. And did you catch verse four? He said, I even prayed. He prayed for his enemies despite all the wrong that they had done towards him. Now, David is not a man free from sin. In other Psalms, we see where he confesses his sins. But here in this Psalm, he is making a plea to God that only God can bring righteousness and justice. And he knows that only God can do that. This prayer that David has is to seek punishment on the wicked. Now he knows he stands before God innocent. This is why he writes this prayer. This is why he uses these words because he knows he's innocent before God. His heart is free from guilt because he knows his enemies have done him wrong. And this is the basis for his plea. My enemies are wicked. They're evil. Now David does not mention who his enemy is. He doesn't need to. He knows that God knows who it is. He's leaving it all in God's hands to bring justice. He knows he can't, but he even refers to his enemies as the accusers, something that we know that Satan is called because he is known as the accuser of the brethren. And now let's read the words of revenge that David prayed over his enemies. Set a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Oh, oh my, some harsh words, right? Over 10 years ago, my husband and I were out driving and there was a car in front of us that had a bumper sticker that said prayer for the president. And it, all it had was Psalm 109 verses eight through 10. So I immediately pulled that up thinking, wow, what kind of prayer is this gonna be? And as I read it, these were the words that I read. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Those were ugly words. A prayer for a president? As I read that psalm, I looked at my husband and we both looked at each other in a reverent fear for that driver who would so brazenly wish a curse on the president. These are harsh words. Now we need to understand that these were words from David. We know him to be a man after God's own heart. He stood in confidence before God, his righteous judge, and he prayed these words. Now in the remaining verses of Psalm 109, David goes on seeking God's retribution. And the pain of his betrayal is deep and he wanted God to avenge his hurt because he knew only God, the righteous judge, was the only one who could. Betrayal, it's painful, isn't it? It's a breach of trust. It's a stab in the back. It's a double cross. It's a disloyalty. It's a deceit. And if you've been there, you can relate to this pain that David speaks of, the crush, the damage, the shattering it does to your very being. So what can we learn from this psalm, this prayer of revenge? How can we consider it inspired by God and useful? Well, number one, not everyone has walked in the shoes that David has. There are those who can relate to this deep agony and this desire for, for vengeance that only God can give. Only God can give. And number two, during the Old Testament times, the people did not have a clear understanding of judgment that would take place. They could only pray that God would send justice and they wanted to see it happen right there and then. But they didn't fully understand what you and I understand today about judgment, that no one will escape it. Look here real quickly at 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All the pleas for justice and revenge in this psalm were based on God's character, which is holy and righteous, and on his covenant promises. Bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. 
And God's statement to the Israelites still stands true for us today. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. So let's bring this all together now. Is this what we've read so far in the Old Testament Psalms, a contradiction to what we see in the New Testament teachings of Jesus? Do we face enemies? Do we face betrayal? Have we been falsely accused? Do we see people getting away with wrongdoing? Are there atrocities of evil today that make us cry out for justice? After our lesson last week about wars of extermination, doesn't it seem contradictory that God commanded destruction of enemies while Jesus said, love them? One thing to keep in mind is God's direction to war with the enemies was to drive out the evil and the idolatry so that the Israelites could conquer the promised land. Does the Old Testament have a different teaching about enemies than the New Testament does? Let's look back at the Old Testament because when God's people left Egypt and they wandered for 40 years, God told them how to treat their enemies that they would encounter. And it was a matter of moral principle. Let's look here at an example in Exodus 23. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help them with it. Why would kindness be expressed toward an enemy? The book of Proverbs shows us that this is an issue of the heart. Let's look here at 24, 17 to 18. Do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. Proverbs 25. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. So the Old Testament taught of how to treat enemies. It was a matter of moral principle, right? And here in Proverbs 25, we see these strange use of words, coals on their head, burning coals on their head. Now, this phrase is a metaphor that has several meanings. It could represent God's justice, it could represent mercy, and then it could represent shame as coals on the head would make a face turn red, right? So whether your enemy accepts your kindness or not, God will reward you for blessing your enemies. So the Old Testament taught how to treat our enemies. And in the New Testament, we actually find where Paul quoted Proverbs 25 in Romans 12, 20. The highest value that God wants his people to express is love. We're familiar with what Jesus taught in Mark 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus summed it up by saying that the Old Testament law and his New Testament teachings were the same commandments. Matthew 22, 40 says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He also said in Matthew 5, 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Jesus describes here how our love should be the same for everyone, unconditional. It's just like God's love, like the sun that rises and the rain that falls on both the evil and the good. It's unconditional. So if you've been betrayed or you've been wronged, do what Jesus said. Love and pray for your enemies. But you say, it's hard to do. We can't do that. It's impossible. They've done wrong. They deserve no mercy. But remember, God is the righteous judge. And he says, it is mine to repay. I will avenge. And we need to leave that judgment in God's hands. We need to trust him because he alone is the righteous judge. We may not see judgment take place today on our enemies or those who have done us wrong, but we have to know that in the end, when final judgment happens, God will avenge. 
God calls on us to love and to forgive, just like he did for us. Revenge is not sweet. Do not get mad and do not get even. Remember the word of God tells us, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So here's the challenge for all of us. Let's put into practice loving those who are not deserving of kindness. Let's pray for those who we feel are not deserving of mercy. If you run into someone this week, and let's just be honest here, someone you don't like, someone you don't care for, someone who's done you wrong, can you show them a kindness? Maybe you see them in line behind you through the drive-thru. Pay for their meal. They may not ever know it was you, but God knows. If you see them in the store, don't avoid them. Smile, say hello, move on. If it's someone you see every day at work, pray blessings over them. Pray for a promotion for them. And you know what will result? Change in them? Maybe not. Change in you? Absolutely. Why? Because you cannot dislike a person who you're praying blessing over. You cannot hate a person that you keep showing kindness to. You cannot hold a grudge over a person that you just blessed with kindness. You live your life in faith and obedience to God, and He will reward you. After all, He is sovereign, and He alone is the righteous judge. He alone is the one who will avenge. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. We know that your word is given to us to teach us and to guide us. We have seen that the psalmist who wrote these words went through emotions very much like ours. They had sorrows, they had pain, they suffered because of the actions of others. But we have learned today that you alone are the one who can take vengeance on the evil and the wickedness that we see. I pray that you will give us the boldness to love and pray for those who we find hard to get along with, those who've done us wrong, and those who do evil in this world. Help us to take on your heart, Father, one of unconditional love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who alone gives us the strength. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Catch you next week.